Hi, everyone, and welcome to our virtual live at Frost Science. We are so excited to have you here for our next installment. And we are so lucky to be partnering with Florida Atlantic University's um, College of Arts and Sciences on this virtual live program because we have two amazing female scientists able to join us today. And so we're very excited to have them talk to you all about bird songs and monkey business in this installment. We encourage you to go ahead and ask any questions through our comment box throughout the duration of the talks. And at the end, we'll actually have both of our wonderful scientists joining us. Um, for a little bit of back and forth and conversation about everything you heard today. But first, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Rindy Anderson. So Dr. Rindy Anderson is an assistant professor in the Department of Biolog Biological Sciences in the College of Science at Florida Atlantic University. She has a BS in Zoology from Arizona State University an MS in Marine Science from the University of San Diego, and a PhD in Behavioral Ecology from the University of Miami. Wow, that is one extremely well-educated um, woman that I'm proud to get to know. She worked as a postdoc and then a research associate at Duke University before joining the faculty at FAU in 2014. Dr. Anderson's research interests are in behavioral ecology, communication, bioacoustics, cognition, and avian ecology and conservation. And we are so lucky and excited to have her with us today to learn all about bird songs. Rindy, how are you doing today? I am fantastic. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. You bet this is going to be fun. This is going it to be cool. Is. Let's, um, let's one quick question just before you get started. What okay. made you interested in bird songs? Oh, well, that's very interesting. Um, I actually <laughs> was, I was doing that marine science degree. I was working with marine mammals. And as you might know, marine mammals make all kinds of interesting sounds. And so what I fell in love with was animal communication and how animals use sound to communicate. And that's one of the things that we focus on in my lab. And I'll be talking about that today. Amazing. Well, please jump right in. I can't wait to hear all about this. That. So I'll do this. I'll share my screen, which is this, and we'll go. All right. All right. So it looks like you guys can see that. So like I said, we're going to be talking a little bit today about why birds sing and why I think it matters that we know why birds sing. But first, let's talk about animal communication. So the point that I want to start with here is that the natural world all around us is filled with the sights and the sounds and the smells of animals communicating with each other. Whether it's the bright blue plumage of this indigo bunting, or the claw waving display of this fiddler crab, or the red dewlap display of this anole lizard, or the resonant chirping or booming of frogs and toads, the world is filled with animal communication. So what do I mean by the term communication? Let's define that. So communication is the transfer of information using signals. So in these photos here that I'm showing you, that these behaviors, these colors, these sounds, these displays, these are all for the purpose of transferring information, for communicating. And all of these traits that you see pictured here are communication signals. So let's unpack this a little bit more. What do I mean by a signal? So many of the kinds of traits or qualities that animals have, like their health or their genetics, these are not perceivable. These are hidden traits. And so signals evolve as a way of advertising these hidden traits. Let's take an example, the example of this lovely male songbird here. He needs to convince a female to mate with him. And so to do that, he should advertise 
his best qualities, right? He should advertise, he might advertise, I'm smart. He might advertise, I'm a great dad. He might advertise, I'm healthy. So these are, these are the kinds of qualities that a female could not know about him just by looking at him. And so this species evolved bright yellow plumage and loud complicated song as a way of advertising those traits. The bright plumage and the song of this male bird are signals. They are communication signals that convey information about this male. So my research is focused on this question about animal communication. What kinds of information do animal signals contain? Let's look at how we're asking this particular question in this beautiful Northern Cardinal, which many of you have in your backyards right now here in South Florida. My PhD student, Morgan Slevin, is interested in the Cardinal because they have this bright red plumage and that bright red beak and because they have lots of different kinds of songs. What information might the bright red body parts, the plumage and the beak and the song contain? What information do these signals contain? Well, Morgan wonders if these signals might contain information about the bird's health, right? Oops. So you might not know this, but our bodies contain communities, complicated communities, diverse communities of microbes that live in our hair and our eyelashes and inside our bodies. And one of the really important microbiomes that we have is called the gut microbiome. We have the gut microbiome, this community of microbes that lives in our gut, and so does the cardinal. Well, believe it or not, there's a really important relationship between the gut and the brain. The gut and the brain exchange information. They communicate these, through different systems, hormones, receptors, other kinds of chemicals that work in our bodies. And there's this homeostatic relationship between the gut and the brain. What happens in our brain affects what happens in our gut, and what happens in our gut affects what happens in our brain. It can affect things like our sleep and our mood and our social behavior. Well, there's an important third component about the lives of animals that we need to think about, and that is stress. We have stress, animals have stress. And what we know is that stress can definitely affect our brains, right? Prolonged stress can affect both our brains and then our guts, right? Because again, the brain and the gut are connected. And so prolonged stressors can eventually have really negative consequences for the health of that gut microbiome, right? And it can disrupt that really wonderful relationship between the brain and the gut. Well, Morgan, oh, is there a question? There is a question. So Griffin H10 is wondering how that lovely cardinal bird there gets to be the color red. Well, that, that is where I'm going with this, and, and you led me right to it, right? So what Morgan thinks, his hypothesis, is that cardinals might be so red because that red signals, it communicates information about the cardinal's health. And in particular, it might communicate information about the cardinal's gut microbiome health. One thing we know that I'm not picturing here is that the redness of a cardinal varies from male to male. Not all male cardinals are equally red. Some of them are br the brightest red, some of them are duller red, right? So not every male cardinal gets to be the brightest red, right? And so that indicates that there is information about the redness that might be acting as a signal. And in particular, that beak, that bright red beak here, this is what we call a plastic trait, meaning that the redness of that beak can change pretty quickly. It can get very red or less red. And Morgan's idea is that stress can cause what we call dysbiosis. It can disrupt the relationship between the gut and the brain 
and make the bird overall less healthy. And if the bird is overall less healthy, we might see the redness of that beak get duller. And so the information contained in redness is how healthy that bird is. And in particular, if Morgan's correct, how healthy his gut microbiome is. And one more thing that I'll tell you, um, just be because you asked about how do they get to be so red. It's really interesting. Male cardinals cannot make the color red. They have to get it from their food. And one thing that male cardinals really like to eat, if you ever noticed, is red things. There was red things, red berries, contain something called carotenoid pigments. That's what makes them red and orange and yellow. So the cardinal has to be really good at finding the right kinds of food to eat so that it can digest lots and lots of those carotenoid pigments so that it can be red. And it puts that red into its plumage. So you're telling me that this is literally a case where you are what you eat. I've been wanting to say that this whole time. <laughs> Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, for the, and for the beak part, right, that that's changing all the time, that could, be, that could have something to do with, because what I didn't tell you either is that carotenoid pigments are also a really important part of our immune system. And so if an individual is sick, if they're fighting off a disease, if they're not very healthy, if their gut microbiome is sick, they need to devote a lot of those carotenoid pigments that they're getting out of those red berries and put it into their immune system to help fight the sickness. And so what that means is there's less of those carotenoid pigments to make him red. And so a female who's, a, who's trying to decide which male to mate with or a male that's trying to decide which other male to fight with can look at the redness of the feathers and the beak of a male and know something about his health his strength, right? So this is what I mean when I say animal communication signals contain information. They contain information, in this case, we think about the health of an individual cardinal, when we can tell that by how red he is, right? Okay, now let's talk about birdsong because that's a, a, sort of the focus of what we do in my lab. So birdsong is what we call a dual function signal. It means that bird song serves two primary purposes, has two functions, right? One of those functions is for courtship. Males sing to females in order to attract females to their territory and to stimulate them through mating, right? It's, it's a way to convince a female to mate with them, with a given male, and to have a, a, a brood, a, a nest full of baby birds. So that's one reason male birds sing, to impress the ladies, to flirt. The other primary function of bird song is to fight. Males sing to compete with, to intimidate, to repel rival males, right? So two functions, courtship and competition. So let's look a little bit more about birdsong. One of the things that's so fascinating to me about birdsong is that it is so different across all the different songbird species. So here's an example of that. Here's a beautiful white crowned sparrow, very common sparrow in North America. A male white crowned sparrow sings just one song type. He learns that song when he's a baby and he'll sing it for the rest of his life. Here's a male swamp sparrow. Male swamp sparrows have just a few song types, usually two or three. In contrast, we study the Bachman sparrow, who has a huge repertoire of song types. Male Bachman sparrows sing dozens of, dozens of song types, usually on average 40 to 50 different song types. And so one of the main questions that we're interested in in my lab is, what is this all for? Why does a male Bachman sparrow need 50 song types when a white crowned sparrow just has one and seems to attract the ladies and repel rivals just fine with just the one? So how do we explain this? And before we get any further, let me play you the Bachman sparrow songs because they're really lovely. Oops. So 
So what, you, what I hope you can hear there, and what I hope you can see by looking at these spectrograms, these spectrograms are visual representations of sound, because it turns out humans are vis visual creatures. We, do, we can learn more by looking at something than hearing it. But what I, could, I hope you could both see and hear is that each of the song types in a Bachman Sparrow repertoire are really pretty different from each other, right? So he's got this huge complexity, this big vocal repertoire. What's he doing with it? Why does he need all that? And it's even more complicated than that. So what I just showed you there was the Bachman Sparrow's primary song repertoire, right? These are the big, loud songs that he sings. He's got 40 or 50 of those. They also sing something called whisper song. And this is when they take one of their normal primary song types and they sing it very quietly. They sing it so quietly that if you're standing 10 feet away, you might not even hear it. What's that for? And then we won't have time to talk about this today. They sing something called warble song, which is completely different from primary song. Let me show you what that sounds like. contained in that, right? So my point here is that Bachman sparrows have this really elaborate and complex repertoire. We want to know what they're doing with it. Well, one of the primary ex Oh, yes? So Allison was asking, how do you understand what they're thinking about and saying? And maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. Yes, I'm going there next. I'm going to tell you about some experiments that we've done and hopefully answer that question. So real quickly, I just want to say there's two, there's two explanations for why we think some birds have all these huge repertoires. And one is that song is an ornament, right? Remember how I talked about the two functions of song and one of them is that Bachman sparrows or that male song birds are, uh, they use it as a courtship signal, right? They're trying to impress the ladies. So here we could think about these large vocal repertoires as an ornament, kind of like the peacock's tail, right? By carrying around that big elaborate tail, the male peacock is advertising his strength and his genetic quality to females in order to mate with them, right? So maybe, so we have this little Bachman sparrow who's very drab, maybe his ornament to impress the ladies is a big, large peacock's tail of a vocal repertoire, right? So that's one of the explanations. The other one, remember the other, the other point of song, the other purpose of song in songbirds is that it is a threat. It's a competitive signal between males when they're being aggressive with each other, right? So it's a get out signal or a threat signal. So my student, my master's student, Paula, was studying this. She was interested in this aggressive function of song. And one of the things that she studied is something called song type matching. Song type matching, if you look at this image here, so here's a Bachman Sparrow singing this song and Bachman Sparrow singing this song. Now, in song type matching, a bird can reply to his rival using the same song that that rival just sang. This is a way of directing a reply at a specific individual, right? If they're out in the field, there's lots of birds all singing at once. Who do you know who's talking to you, right? You can direct that signal right at this guy. And in some species, song type matching predicts an escalation. It's a way of communicating the intentions to make the encounter more aggressive. Right, so this is one of the things that Paul was studying. And this led in general to a series of studies, several of which we publish now in Bachman Sparrows, looking at song as an aggressive signal, looking at that male-male communication function of song. Right? And so Saba Ali, an undergraduate in my lab, Paul, who I introduced, and my PhD student, Joe, we've all been working on this question of song as an aggressive signal in male Bachman Sparrows. So how do we do this to get to her question? We use something in the field called a simulated territorial intrusion. So the idea here is that we go out into the field, we find a male Bachman sparrow who's claimed a territory, we study him for a while, we observe him so that we know the size and shape of that territory. And then early in the morning, we go out and we put a replica of a male Bachman sparrow paired with a little playback speaker that plays those songs that I just played for you. We put that on his territory. We we strap the, this to a tree branch or a limb or something to make it look like a rival has intruded on the territory and is, in, is intruding as an in attempting to take over this territory from the live male who, who we're going to watch. 
simulated territorial intrusion. And then what we do is we study what the, the territory owner does when he, when he notices this rival on his territory. We use all kinds of quantitative measures. We collect all kinds of data about the bird's movements and we record every song he sings. We take that back into the lab and we analyze that, right? And in this particular case, the study that I'm gonna tell you about next, we were interested in asking, do any of the Bachman Sparrow's songs or vocalizations predict whether or not he will attack that replica? It, there, it's not even a great replica, but I can tell you the males are very fooled by it and they will attack it as if it were a live male, right? So our question is, do any of the songs or singing behaviors that males sing, are they threats? Will they predict attack? Is that the information that those signals contain? Right, so we did all these simulated territorial intrusions and I'll just skip to the, the, uh, the, the uh, take home message here in, in our Bachman Sparrows. What we found is that whisper song is the only predictor of attack that we could find. Whisper songs are threats. It's crazy. And so it's sort of like this, sing softly, but carry a big stick, right? These guys threaten each other by whispering instead of yelling. Well, so let's think about that. Why would you whisper to threaten a rival? What possible purpose could that serve? How does this work? What, is, what information does a whisper contain? Well, let, let's unpack this a little bit, right? So as I've been talking about this, this communication has been going back and forth between a signaler and the receiver. It's, a, it's just a two-way street there. What we need to remember is that actually, all animals in the environment can eavesdrop on this exchange of information and they can get their own information from it, right? So for example, when two males are locked in a song battle, predators can eavesdrop on that and take advantage of the fact that these two birds are distracted by each other and come in and eat one of them, right? And we know that females and other male sparrows in the area can eavesdrop on fights between males and determine who won or lost. And that's in for useful information for them. It might change their behavior, right? And so uh, the point here is that whisper song signal attack, that's the information that's contained. And the reason they're quiet is because it is beneficial for two males who are interacting to conceal that escalated interaction just between the two of them so that others cannot eavesdrop on that. Yes. So we had a question and I don't know if it's related to this or not, but from Glorabelle, they were wondering, they have a bird that sings outside their window at 7.30 a.m. every day, which I'm sure is beautiful. Um, and they were wondering if there's a reason why they're singing at the same time every day. Absolutely. And, and I bet it's a mockingbird <laughs> because mockingbirds are everywhere and they sing constantly. I have a mockingbird out it, that um, there's a street light on all night outside my house. And this mockingbird sings all night long, two, three, four in the morning. Just he never stops. Um, so, yeah. So the re this is called the dawn chorus. You might have heard that term before. It's something that songbirds do. They sing a lot in the mornings and it's thought that this dawn chorus, this reason for singing as soon as the sun comes up, is a way of advertising that they are still there and they still own that territory, right? It's a, it's a signal of ownership, right? And I'll bet that that bird goes to just a few different song posts and sings and sings and sings. And so what he's saying is, what he's communicating is, this is mine, I survived the night, I wasn't eaten by an owl or a possum or a snake, I'm still here and this is still mine. So that's what he's doing. And he's also probably trying to get a female to come mate with him. You'll, you might notice once he's mated with a female and they have a nest, he won't sing as much. I, I find that kind of hilarious. <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> yes. Also comforting from someone who's had um, those lovely birds outside their windows for yes. all hours of the night. Um, <laughs> you're just like, please mate, please mate. Um, <laughs> we have another question from Maritz. They're wondering if birds trick other birds. Oh my goodness. Well, isn't that an interesting question? And that is 
the topic that I was actually going to talk about today, but my talk got too long and so I never got there. But one of the main questions that we ask in my lab is, do animals lie to each other? Do they deceive? What do you think the answer is? What do you think? So remember all those pictures that I showed you before about all those animals communicating all kinds of information. What do you think? Do animals deceive each other or are they honest? Do they signal reliably? Think about that for a second. We know the answer. <laughs> the answer is that they are honest. They are reliable on average. So what that means without getting too into the weeds with it is that on average, these signals that we're talking about, whisper songs, bright plumage, visual displays, tend to reliably communicate about the intrinsic qualities of the signaler. And the reason for that is that most of these signals are costly to produce, so only truly strong individuals can afford to pay the costs of the signal, and because lies are eventually ignored. If a cheater or a mutant gene comes into a population and a signal goes from being largely reliable to largely unreliable, natural selection will act to have receivers stop paying attention to it because it's no longer benefiting them to assess that signal. And then the signal disappears. Hope that answered your question. And I'm about out of time here. So I just, I think I only had a couple of slides. Yeah, this is my last slide anyway. Um, so what I wanted to do today was tell you a little bit about why birds sing. And I'll bet you could answer that question now. If anyone ever asked you why birds sing, you know, before maybe you thought, oh, because the weather's nice or, you know, or, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're singing to the clouds or whatever it might be. No, singing is really life or death stuff for birds. They're singing to have babies and they're singing to fight and, and keep their resources, right? So you, you guys know that now. So why does it matter? Like, why does it matter why birds sing, right? I think this is actually an important question. There's lots of answers to that. But what I wanted you to take away from today is it matters because the natural world is inherently interesting. It's fascinating. We should want to know what information these animal communication signals contain. We should want to know why an old lizards have a dewlap display and why they're using it. It's just fascinating. We should want to understand how the natural world works. And by doing that, we can understand how behavior works, how behavior evolves. And importantly, when we know this very important information about the social behavior of animals, it can help us conserve them. It can help us save them when they start to decline. So it's very important to know why birds sing and it's very important to know why all these animals do what they do. Thank you so much, Wendy. That's amazing. I'm definitely gonna appreciate that uh, mockingbird a, a little more now outside. <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, so thank you so much. We do have many more questions that I'll save till the end. Um, so if I didn't ask your question yet, I will try to get back to it at the end. We just wanna make sure our next presenter has some time to talk about monkey business, one of my favorite topics. Um, so with us today, we, I, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kate Detweiler. Um, she's an associate professor of anthropology at Florida Atlantic University, where her research focus is on the evolution and conservation of African forest monkeys. Her primatology lab is based in the biological sciences department and represents an interdisciplinary collaboration between the anthropology department and the College of Arts and Letters and the biological sciences department and environmental sciences program in the College of Science. That's quite a collaboration, so I'm excited to hear more. Her lab specializes in studying rare and endangered primate species in the Congo Basin Rainforest in the Democratic Republic of Congo, hybrid monkeys in Gombe, you'll correct me if I said that wrong, National Park in Western Tanzania, and a local population of introduced African monkeys living in the mangrove swamps near Fort Lauderdale Airport, if you can believe it. 
She completed a bachelor's degree from Bates College, where she received the Thomas J. Watson Fellowship upon graduation and earned her doctoral degree in anthropology at New York University. She also completed a postdoctoral science um, fellowship at Columbia University in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology. And she received a little bit of fame um, when she discovered a new monkey species that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Um, and that media coverage included pieces in National Geographic, Science Magazine, and Nature. So Kate, we're so excited to have you. Uh, one question I wanted to ask you is, what made you love monkeys? <laughs> so we're starting with the question. Cool. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Yeah, thanks again for hosting this. I um, Okay, what made me start to love monkeys? Um, I don't think I set out to start to love monkeys. I fell in love with the hybrid question when I was an undergraduate student. So I was tasked to find a independent study project when I was doing a, a course in Tanzania. And I came across a very small blurb in a guidebook to African forest mammals about hybrid monkeys. And I thought, I thought it was wrong. So I said, I better go find out more about these hybrid monkeys. And, and ever since I've now been hooked on monkeys and I went from a biology program to anthropology because monkeys are often housed with anthropologists. So I am um, at my core, I'm a biologist, but I, I have now, I have dual training in anthropology and biology. So that's what I'm gonna do a little bit today. Okay, no more questions, Angela? I see the logo. Okay, that's my cue. I'm gonna continue. So I have a talk prepared and then we'll have questions as, as Angela is going to um, share with, with me from all of you. But what I'm gonna focus today on is hybrid monkeys. And this is a lot to do with high, um, monkey business as the the sort of talk title is about. And what I'm going to start with here is uh, this, this idea, are hybrid monkeys a dead end or a new beginning? And this is the research topic of um, hybridization. So maybe you've heard of hybridization. You've probably for sure uh, come across hybrid cars on the highway. And when we talk about hybridization and biology, we're talking about the crossing between species. So that's when you have two different species of birds, like we just heard um, Rindy talking about, when, when they would make a mistake and say, that signal looks good, even though you're a different species. So this image here is one of my new favorites from an article in um, Science Advances. And it's about a recent genomic study. So looking at DNA among the five living uh, species of Panthera, so the big cats. So this is where I, ask you, and if you were in my audience, you'd, you'd shout out or raise your hand, but do you know the different species of, of big cats, the largest big cats? And if you're watching with a partner or you're watching with somebody in your family or you just want to jot it down, can you do it working from the head to the tail? Okay, I, I will play along with you and-, and Okay, thank you, Angela. <laughs> um, I'm probably gonna get this wrong. That's okay, start with the head. Let's see, that looks like a leopard. Is she right? Jaguar. I was gonna say jaguar, man. <laughs> you were not right. Okay, go uh, next. <laughs> the second one looks like a lion. a lion. You are right. Okay. Next. Now, now is it the leopard? <laughs> nope, maybe others will know. What is it? Snow leopard, close. <laughs> I was, I was close. A, a tiger, a tiger. Excellent, Angela. And the tail is, ooh, I don't think that's classified as a big cat, but a bobcat. Okay, no, it's not a big cat. We will work on your systematics after this. <laughs> this is a leopard. Finally, okay, a leopard. great. So what did this study find and why am I starting a monkey business talk all about cats? So this is the evolutionary tree. So this is the information the scientists put together based on the DNA among the five living cats that Angela just told you about. And what we see in the evolutionary history of cats is that 
they had hybridization events when members of one species mated with members of another species and the hybrids, those offspring, acted as like a, a conduit, a way for genes to move from one species to the next. And the paper is really interesting. It highlights these different adaptive and neutral and, and sometimes if they're, if they're deleterious or a, a mutation that causes um, negative effects like what Rindy just spoke about. But here they found some evidence that some optic nerve genes from lions introgressed, moved from the ancestor, the, those populations of lions that, it, that were in contact with the jaguar. And that's hard to believe because right now where we find lions, of course, is just where they've made it, right? They've been um, extirpated, they've gone extinct in many places. And in the past, they had some exchange. And so this ends up being more common than we first thought. And when we first thought about hybridization, even going back to Charles Darwin, he was very confused about hybrids. And, and from sort of his start going forward, naturalists are always wondering what to do about hybrids because they don't fit. They don't usually fit in our understanding of how species work. And so a species is about those members who find each other's signals meaningful, they choose each other as mates, and their offspring hold on to those adaptive, um, we call them alleles, or these adaptive genes that allow that species to, to thrive, and, and that's how evolution works. So what to do about these pesky hybrids? Um, and we, we find out now through genomics, through looking at DNA of all different types of animals um, and plants, right? We understand that that one of the American sunflower plants is a hybrid species. We know there's a lot of bird hybrids, uh, and we also know that frogs hybridize. So almost in any lineage we look at, we can find hybrids. So as an anthropologist, I wanna ask the question, hmm, what about cases of hybridization in primates? Do primates also hybridize? We're so smart, right? Primates have, excellent uh, cognitive abilities of problem solving on the spot. We are very visual. Our senses, we use our eyes, we take in visual cues, and we bring meaning to them. So why would we make a mistake and mate with a member of our different species? Maybe primates don't have cases of hybridization. And what we find though, uh, spoiler alert, is that there's a lot of cases also of hybridization in primates, but again, just like the cats, it's in our past. So we look in different primate lineages, for example, chimpanzees and bonobos, and we find they've hybridized in the past. We look at different macaque species, the, the image that you saw when you maybe signed up for this Zoom call, those are macaques. They also have a lot of hybridization, and we know about this by looking at their DNA. And so we can even ask as an anthropologist, well, you know, did humans hybridize? And, and the answer is yes. And what we're finding from the technological advances of, of using DNA from difficult to get at resources, we can get some DNA out of our fossil record or out of extinct human populations or our human ancestor populations. So just like I showed the evolutionary tree of the big cats and there's this gene flow in the past among the big cats, there's gene flow in our past among the different lineages of our human ancestors. And many of us find this very fascinating, just sort of inherently fascinating to learn more about our scientific past. Where, where do humans come from? And so this is another really interesting paper, all recent uh, publications because these findings require new technology. And so again, you can see a complex evolutionary tree or this um, history that's showing a lot of arrows and dashed lines of, of genetic material moving. And it's only a little bit that we can, we can trace, but as we get more and more advanced with our statistics and learning how to comb through the genome, we'll understand more and more about our um, population history, about our evolutionary history. Hi, Angela. Hi, Kate. So quick question on this, because this is fascinating. You're right. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I want to get back to the monkeys, so yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but 
this is still an area just like with the monkeys that's being very much researched, isn't it? And, and we don't know the whole picture and we don't know the whole story and we're making new discoveries all the time. Is that right? Yeah, it is. It's really true. And if you pick up the New York Times, um, they love writing the scientific uh, articles about the recent research. And, you know, as Rindy and I are both trying to present, you know, if you get into the weeds, it's really complicated and the statistics are really complicated. So you need to dive deep into uh, genomics and, and how to understand when a mutation pops up in a lineage. Is it, is it from uh, hybridization is the mutation from just the old history of the lineage or was it you know in parallel like you know bats and birds have the same sort of you know they fly but it comes from a very different evolutionary history so it's really complex and it requires a lot of um, specialty so I'm gonna continue because I see your logo Angela but what about if you want to study hybridization in the present, you, we understand that it occurs in the past and we understand you can use genomes to look at hybridization, but what if we wanted to actually see hybrids and study these activities, the, the mating, the behavior that you just were introduced to from Rindy's talk? Can we study hybridization in primates today? And what I'm here to say is yes, and this is a hybrid. And in fact, we have more hybrids. We have baby hybrids and we have a mama hybrid. And, and this is a huge area of research in my lab. And, and again, when you asked uh, why do I love monkeys so much, I actually love hybrids so much. <laughs> so this is, um, this is what I spent a lot of time thinking about, these hybrids, right? These exceptions when scientists go out into nature and we think we understand how it works and we see something that doesn't fit into our textbook definitions of a species and we are told that hybrids are probably unfit they're probably a dead end that maybe they're not going to be anything important and i find this really challenging so i like i like looking at this question and it's a fascinating question we do have um a question about kind of more general with monkeys and what kind of monkeys, what do they eat? Are they yeah. vegetarian? Are they vegetarian? Does it apply when they're a hybrid that they eat the same thing? How does that yeah. work? Yeah, so I have, a, I have a whole slide on that. Do you want me to zoom forward on it? Or um, let me see if I can go forward real fast. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Um, I'm giving you all my spoilers of these beautiful Okay, here we go. We are studying the diet of our hybrid group. And in the middle, it's not a hybrid. I'm gonna to get to you, I'm gonna go back to my slides, but this is what we're finding, that these animals are eating a ton of insects. And so Sarah, a, a master's student with me, studied what do the parent species eat and what do the hybrids eat? And the answer is they love insects, all of them. So I'm gonna go back to the um, couple more slides, but we can keep going with inter um, questions if that seems to be, uh, more exciting. So anyway, what are the Gwenins and why did I say Gwenins love to hybridize? They are the most colorful group of mammals. So if you don't know a Gwenin when you started this um, activity with frost, then I'm hoping you know one when you leave. So they're often found in the top of the trees in rainforests in Africa. In fact, they only live in Africa. And so this is a map of the African continent and all those colorful um, sort of, I don't know what you call them, blobs or schmears or their distribution. So that's where these animals live. So they cover that middle of Africa, that area around the equator. And that's because they love rainforests where the rain is and the trees are tall. And so I am talking about Gombe today and, and we'll talk to you a little bit about the Congo, like Angela said in my intro, but Gombe is where these hybrids live. And when I think a lot about hybridization, I'm going to move my cursor. We talk about at the edge of a forest. So this is the giant Congo Basin forest here on the top of Lake Tanganyika. And this rainforest is trying to stretch across the lake, but it peters out and a new ecosystem starts. And that's the Eastern um, Miombo woodlands. And then it transitions to the savanna where you find the, those big lions and the giraffes. So at that edge where it's sort of the last fingers of forest is where I'm working. And this is a really, um, important site for primate research. Dr. Jane Goodall has worked there for 60 years. We're celebrating this um, summer. 
And this is what I would argue a real treasure for, for hybrids. So you don't see any hybrids in this photo, but I've spent a lot of time, and now um, students in my lab are spending time walking through the forest looking for these hybrids and, and finding out questions like, what do they eat? Who do they like to mate with? And how do they deal with predators? So chimpanzees eat these monkeys. And maybe there's something about the hybrid color. Maybe they could be a little more camouflage. We don't know, but what we're studying is hybrids in their ecosystem. We're not studying their genomes, or we will, but we're complementing it with their ecology. So just like Rindy was talking about, why do birds sing? What's important when a bird sings outside your window? How do these hybrids deal with this ecosystem of primates, even humans being there? And baboons eat fruit and they're competitors. And also baboons can eat our monkeys. So they're two predators. Now we have red colobus. They're in the same trees. And so they don't eat monkeys. They're vegetarians. They only eat leaves, but they poop a lot. And what's in their poop? Parasites. So maybe the parasites are causing, you know, stresses to these, to these monkeys. So we had a question from Leslie. They were wondering, yes. are these hybrids genetically stronger? And I think this is one of the questions you're trying to figure out. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm so glad this came up. Okay, so are the hybrids genetically stronger? We don't know that answer yet, but we are working on it. And I have, I think my next slide is going to, no, let, me, let me zoom forward a little bit. I can show you what what we're working on. Um, we're working on understanding the genetics of the parents, uh, working on understanding the genetics of the individuals, and we wanna know, are the hybrids at all at an advantage? Could they be having this combined genome of the two parents that are allowing them to solve all these problems that I just talked about, predators, parasites, finding food, having babies, um, and so you, we have to do a lot of work um, before we'll be able to answer that question. But we take their poop, we organize it into a, a catalog of lots of lots of poop, and then we have um, a process of extracting the DNA, and that's what we're looking at. And we've already had some really exciting results that, that yes, in a way, the hybrids are doing very well. And they've, they've survived, and they've in fact moved DNA into one of our parent species. So on the far right, we have a case that's very similar to the cats where our blue monkeys at Gombe have DNA from the other species. So we already know part of the hybrid story lives on. So the blue monkey DNA is, is holding that story of, of hybridization from a long time ago in this forest. And I have a video that I can show you about the parent species and, and here they are. Well, maybe not, hmm, whoops, let's see. Let me go back. Okay, I'm gonna go in the, pro the way I was thinking it would. So here are the parent species, red tails on the left, blue monkeys on the right. So this is without any indication of a hybrid being around, but they mate. And then here's our hybrid study group. So we know all these animals and I'm gonna play a video. So like Rindy's birds sing, our monkeys give loud calls. And that loud call is supposed to attract mates and to tell other monkeys, I'm a blue monkey, I'm here. But if you saw in the video, red-tailed monkeys are sitting in the same tree. And that female and her baby are listening to this blue male who is also mating with red-tailed females. So it's a really complex situation where we have red-tailed staying red-tailed, blue monkeys staying blue monkeys, and we have a whole bunch of hybrids. So we're looking at diet, um, and we're also really interested in the future. What is going to, to come of these hybrids? And so we want to know over a long period of time, just like Dr. Jane Goodall studies, we want to know in 10 years, in 15 years, in 20 years, how are the hybrids doing? The best way to do this is to learn their phenotype, learn what they look like, 
and recognize them over time. And this is an exciting project that we are almost wrapping up, but we have our pilot version going, and this is using AI to recognize all the animals in our study group. So this was the work with um, Connor Kane, who's, who's a high school student here at FAU, and Charlene Fournier is, is just a new PhD student, and we're going to be taking this path of tracking animals over time to ask questions about hybrid males. Are hybrid males able to have babies? We're going to ask questions about how hybrid females um, how many babies they have, and is that a similar number to the blues and to the reds? Because right now, all the data we have has some pretty exciting results that it looks like our hybrid moms in our study group are the most successful, second to red tail moms. So we are really surprised by this. And this is something just to, to say in a talk, not, <laughs> it's not up for peer review right now, but we're hoping as we add more monkeys to our study, we'll know what is, in Rindy's, when she says the average, like what is this average sort of outcome for a hybrid? And we'll be able to hopefully have a, a say in that. And, and that's really exciting because this is one of the few places you can study hybrid primates in the present, like right here and now. So these monkeys are adorable, first off. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but we had a question from Maddie and Gutia. They're wondering if, are these monkeys in danger? Or at okay, risk being in danger? great. Yeah, thanks, Maddie. Monkeys are endangered in this group. So that picture I showed you of meet the Gwenins, we have some critically endangered monkeys that are in this group. Most of these monkeys live in West Africa, where there's been a real challenge with um, forest habitat and, and deforestation. Right now, red-tailed monkeys and blue monkeys are not endangered. They are um, in good shape, meaning they're, they're not even listed as near threatened from when you look at uh, endangered status. So they are um, on the, the good end of the conservation story, but their close relatives have a lot of, a lot of problems. And one thing we're hoping about the hybridization study is that we're learning this is a very important process for a lot of groups of animals and plants. And when you can protect habitat that supports diversity, when you can have a lot of different close relatives living together, just like your family group, then it's a good thing because then they can, if they have to, listen and look for signals that might be okay. Maybe not the best, but they might be okay. And then they can try out this hybridization. It's, it's a way for nature to experiment. So I just wanna, um, I think I'm gonna be asked to end. Um, and I just wanted to say that I hope sometime I can come back to Frost or uh, College of Science and talk about our work in what I call the heartland of Gwenin. Um, and it's in the DRC, a country that has a massive amount of rainforest and a lot of people who are really interested in the monkeys where they're hunted by bonobos, they're hunted by a lot of top predators and humans actually are, um, are eating these monkeys as, as a food source. And, and so it's kind of like if you know somebody who hunts deer or duck in our country, when the um, hunters go out in the Congo, they, they hunt monkeys. So we're trying to work with them to see if there's ways we can control this hunting so that these animals aren't endangered. And this is something that I'm really excited about because the park is massive and unlike Gombe where it's at that edge, right? There's just a little bit of forest left. There's so much forest in, in the Congo and if it's managed well and, and, the, and the folks in this area are really excited to manage it, we have potential for a lot of Gwenin species to thrive. And, and this is one species that our lab focuses on, and, and it's a species that was discovered by my colleagues, um, John and Therese Hart, and I collaborated with them, and that, that was the intro you heard about. But this is a brand new Gwenin species to, to science, and it's not even um, at a very high risk for, for um, conservation. It's, it's vulnerable because it lives in a very small part of, of the rainforest in Africa. And we use camera traps to capture them because when they're hunted by humans, whoa, you gotta be careful. They are super smart. Monkeys know how to get out of the way from humans if they, if they can. If, um, and so the camera works well to get the 
monkey, even though it knows the camera's there, it's not too afraid of it. And we're able to capture all different um, information about its biology. So another day we'll talk about um, the Congo project, but we have a lot of exciting uh, projects going on there. And this was from last spring, but we have a teaching lab and a research lab. And so we're excited about sharing our love of Gwenins and um, primates and conservation with, with students um, in our lab. And now through, through you and Frost, we're able to share it with others outside of FAU. So thanks to the collaborators in the Congo, really exciting projects, and I, I hope I can come back and talk about that work. And the Gombe team is, is on pause right now. Everybody's at home because of the pandemic, and it's risky for the chimpanzees to be, to be near humans right now, so my project's on hold. But Mary and Moneno say hello from Tanzania. They're both doing fine. Um, and we have time for questions. Thank you so much, Kate. That was wonderful. Um, if I can actually get you to, to unshare your screen so we can bring Rindy back in too for some of these questions, that would be wonderful. Hi yeah. there, everyone is. Hi, everyone. So we did get a lot of questions, a tons of cools, thank yous, all sorts of excitement going on from our listeners. Um, so first I'll start with a couple of questions to Rindy. Uh, there was a lot of questions when you were talking about the cardinals, about um, Wendy asked, are female cardinals also red? Um, Savannah asked, do cardinals have the same color vision as humans? And then Vivian asked that she has one in her backyard and they're alone and she wants to know why others aren't with them. Okay, so let's see. So the first question was, uh, so females. So female cardinals have some red. They are not as bright red as male cardinals are, but female cardinals do have quite a bit of red. They have to get that red from carotenoids, just like the males do. Um, something to, to know about, uh, again, the, the animal world is that males are usually the bright and colorful ones because they have to show off to get the females. The females are usually drab and uncolorful because they have to hide and be camouflaged from predators, right? So typically you see the bright showing male and the drab female hiding in the background, but that's the way it works well in nature since she has to protect those eggs and protect herself. Uh, and it's that way in, in most, turns out, in many animal systems. Um, the second one was, I've already forgotten. The second question was, it was about, um, do they have the same kind of color vision as humans? Uh, excellent question. The answer is they are better. They have mm. better color vision than we do. So we have three cones in our eyes. The, C, the three, and when you put the, the spectrums of all the different shades together and line them up on top of each other, they go from like red to, what is it, violet, right? Birds have four, and they have an extra cone that allows them to see the ultraviolet. And so when a bird looks at the world and when a bird looks at another bird, they see something different than what we see. And so that's a really great question and something that we as researchers have to pay very close attention to when we're doing research and asking questions about color. And then the third question was, what's up with my memory today? <laughs> one was the bird that's alone. Oh, alone. <laughs> well, so does she mean she only sees one male cardinal? Yeah. The female's sitting on a nest. That's my bet. This is, ne this is breeding season. This is the nesting season. I'll bet that female's sitting on a nest somewhere. And if, you're, and if I'm right, in a week or so, you might see a male, a female, and two other cardinals dragging along with them, then they're going to be shoving food in the mouths of those other two cardinals. And those other two cardinals are going to do a begging display where they do this with their, they open their mouths really wide and they do a little wing shivering display and the parents start shoving bugs in their mouth, right? So don't worry about him. He's probably not alone. He's probably just got a, a wife that's baking their babies right now. <laughs> I love that. Um, and Kate, we have a question for you from Dominic, who's five. They wanted to know why there's parasites in the monkey poop. 
Great question. So um, we wash our hands a lot. So most of our parasites don't really get into many of us. But unfortunately, when animals are out in nature, they don't wash their hands. And so when another animal poops and another monkey poops and there's parasites in them, then they will get it when they touch their mouth and then they eat the parasite. And then if it's a parasite that is successful, it grows and grows and has babies and babies. And then unfortunately those animals can get sick. So if you can't wash your hands, you wanna have a really strong immune system that can work hard to get those parasites out. And that even if you have a few, you're gonna be okay, but you don't want them to get to, to be too many or you can get really sick. Well, that's really helpful to know because we did get several questions from people for actually both of you as to whether humans can get diseases from birds or monkeys and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the answer is yes, and they're called zoonotic diseases. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. There are several things. You remember the avian flu, mm -hmm. right? That happened several years back. So absolutely. And so, and ju so just like with Kate, you know, we have to be very careful when we're doing field work that we don't get um, diseases from the birds themselves or that we don't transmit diseases between birds, right? If I catch a bird and I'm touching him and I catch another bird and I've still got his parasites on me, now I'm transferring diseases from this bird to this bird, right? So we are very careful to always wash our hands in between birds. Yes, it's, it's very true. And um, at Gombe, we've been very careful because in the past, when there were more chimpanzees, when the forest was connected, mm -hmm. animals could move in even if there was uh, a disease or something happened that the, the chimpanzees had uh, a high, high mortality or high death, but the forest now is closed. Mm -hmm. So the chimpanzees aren't able to get new members easily into their community to help grow it. And so we as researchers have to be very, very careful going into Gombe and the animals are used to you. So we can transmit diseases to them and they can transmit diseases to us. And especially during a pandemic, we have to follow the same steps that we would follow. So you don't, um, you know, you don't want your neighbors to get sick and you also don't want to bring it into your own family group. So it, it goes both ways with, um, with the primates and with the chimps. And, and one thing to think about too with the, the monkeys that I study, they, are, they have in the past been used for vaccine treatment and some of the monkeys are actually currently being used for vaccine treatment. So I think a conservation message is also while we currently use me, me, you know, medicine um, and testing with primates that we also can work extra hard to conserve those that are wild. So it's um, I think a responsibility we have as stewards, right? Uh, for, for all different species and, and these monkeys are, are included. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, and the last question we're gonna have today is from Randa. And I think it's nice that she's asking this because they wanna know are there any citizen science opportunities mm. for students out there with either of these kinds of research and projects or is there data available so they can learn and play and start um, <laughs> accessing the data and, and diving into it more? Yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, who wants to go first? <laughs> Randy can go first. I just, I just spoke. Yeah, so, um, so we, so we do. It's, um, it, we have undergraduate students involved in our research all the time. You know, in any given semester, I'll have ten different undergraduate students working in the lab, and sometimes we can take local high school students too, right? It, um, we have to jump through a lot of hoops and paperwork and background checks and all. You know, I mean, a lot of uh, red tape to get high school students, they're minors, right? To get them into our labs and doing research with us, whether it be in the lab or in the field, but it is possible. So if a student was really dedicated and really willing to commit time to getting involved, then, then absolutely we can, we can make that happen. And I would say that's true of lots of different kinds of research. I don't know about sending students to Gombe, right, Kate? <laughs> it's a little bit easier. My animals are all out in the backyard, you know? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think, I mean, ideally we could get a lot of our camera trap up and, and available for citizen science. And that is a, a step that we would like to take in our lab. And, and so if anybody who's listening has some uh, computer expertise who could help us 
get everything uh, into that type of a package to, to move to people outside the lab. But just like Rindy, FAU does a fantastic job of trying to open opportunities for undergraduate researchers. And, and Rindy's even organizing something right now with Miami-Dade students. So I'll have two students um, be in the lab this summer. And so there are opportunities, um, but nothing online like a lot of the citizen science projects often turn out to be. So. Not yeah. yet. Maybe we should think about it, Kate. Maybe we should I think, think so, Rindy. I know. I have thousands and thousands and thousands of photos, and we have a, a wonderful volunteer, Lori, who has really helped us a ton. And so it's it's possible to get involved. It's just you kind of have to get through the hoops, as, as Rindy says. Yep. Wonderful. So if you're interested, definitely comment, reach out um, to FAU, Schmidt College of Science. Mm -hmm. and to be in touch with these two amazing scientists that we are so grateful who were able to join us today. Thank you so much again. Um, your talks were fascinating. I love these kinds of things and learning and I learned so much. So thank you very much to both of you. And if you like these kinds of programs, please consider donating to Frost Science at frostscience.org. Anything you can donate will make a difference to make sure we can keep these programs happening for you well into the future. And on that note, thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Our next virtual live at Frost Science will be next Wednesday at 2 p.m. And it's going to be featuring the University of Miami's Dr. Leslie Nutt. And it's all about the periodic table, which is pretty cool too. Um, so thank you everyone so much for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Bye everybody. Bye everyone. Thanks again, Angela. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>